And okay, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just before we get started, I want to give you a little bit of context around who we are and where we're coming from. And so we are the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, and we are a, a part of the Atlanta Speech School. So the Atlanta Speech School is our school that serves students um, with many different learning needs, um, but it's very, it's very much focused on language and literacy. And the Rollins Center takes the work and the science that is really um, nurtured and put into action there out to the larger community. And we provide um, training and free online resources through Cox Campus. So you can see on the image that is coming up on the next screen, you can see that there is a, um, really the Atlanta Speech School is at the center of our operation. Then the Rollins Center is a part of the Atlanta Speech School. And then the Cox Campus is really how we amplify our work, right? And it's our way of how we amplify science-backed practices to really make sure that all of the tools and resources that you need to make sure that students have what they um, need to, to learn to read are available to you at absolutely no cost. We believe that the science of reading doesn't belong behind a paywall and that um, the cost is too high for us to do that, right? Though every kid deserves to have the right to read. And so we're gonna go ahead and um, welcome everyone to our K3 year long journey today. Our topic is vowel classification and articulation. If you've joined us for some of our previous um, sessions. Last time you all talked about consonant classification and articulation, and so today we are hopping in to those vowels. A little bit about myself. Um, my name is Justin Browning. I'm the K-3 through Field Implementation Coordinator at the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, and really what that means is I get to spend my days working with district leadership, um, principals, building level leadership, instructional coaches, educators, and support staff to successfully implement structured literacy in the science of reading in schools. Um, both locally and nationally. And so I'm Orton Gillingham trained, letters trained, top 10 tools trained, and of course, Cox Campus trained. Um, I'm connect I've been really connected with the Rollins Center for a long time, since 2015, where I started as a summer learning facilitator, but I'm actually in my second year um, working on staff here. In my free time, I love theater and just enjoying and exploring new places. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sally Edwards, um, and she's gonna introduce herself. Hey everybody, welcome. I see some familiar names. Um, I got to moderate our last year long journey and I'm seeing some names that I recognize from the last one. So we're so glad you joined us again. Um, I have been in education for 23 years. I've been a classroom teacher, interventionist, academic coach, district literacy coach, all the things. And I have actually worked at Rollins before um, as a birth to five facilitator and then came back in March um, or February or March of last year um, to be a content writer. And so I am working on the content side of Cox campus, working on courses and resources that will eventually go up live for everybody to access. Um, and in my free time, I enjoy cooking, gardening, and we are renovating an 88 year old house. Um, so that's taking up a lot of our time at the moment. Awesome. I want to take a moment just to introduce your moderators for today. So behind the scenes, we have Anisha Donald, and she is one of our K3 content creators and instructional designers. And then Samantha Murillo, who is one of our project managers at the Rollins Center. And so they are answering questions and running the tech behind the scenes. So feel free to reach out and use the chat if you need them at any moment. So a quick roll call. You're going to see a poll pop up in just a moment. Um, we're curious. Are you already a Cox Campus member? Let us know yes or no. And then two, what best describes your role? Let us know a little bit about who is in the room today. Nice, a lot of teachers in the room. We have some instructional leaders, some coaches, some parents, I love that. And then a few people that identify as having other roles in the school. Um, if you're not a Cox Campus member, go ahead and look in the chat. You'll see the link to join Cox Campus. It's www.coxcampus.org. You can click the join button when you get to that homepage and that will take you right there. It's quick and easy. It really takes less than a minute to join um, and you'll have access to thousands of free resources and courses. Okay, and then finally, we're looking to see if y'all completed the course and we can see that there's kind of a mixed, um, a mixed bag of, of who's completed and who hasn't. So that's great. We will take that into account as we're moving through today. So the Cox Campus way, which you can see on the screen are really values that we hold um, dear to us. We wanna make sure that this experience is rewarding, empowering, connecting, safe, and essential. Um, hopefully you can connect with one of these values today and that you um, that this is an added value experience for you and your team as you're joining us. 
Okie doke. So we are going to dive into artic articulation and classification of vowels. And our goals today, you're going to see on the next screen, we hope that we meet these goals with you. Um, we are going to discuss the manner, the voicing, the articulation, and the classification of the vowel phonemes. We're going to explore the instructional strategies for explicitly teaching vowel phonemes, and we'll determine the difference between sound walls and word walls. So at the end of the session, we hope that you're saying, yes, I can do all of these things. But to get us started, we're gonna jump in and do what's called a waterfall chat. And so I'm gonna ask a question, and then I'm gonna ask you to put the answer in the chat when I say go. So go ahead and type your answer when you see the first question, but don't click enter. I will tell you when to go. And then I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, we're not gonna answer these questions right away. We're gonna ask you to kind of wrestle with them and think about them as we go through our course today. So let's go ahead and get the first question up. The first question is, how many English vowel phonemes are there? Type it in, but don't press go yet. How many English vowel phonemes are there? Okay, I see 66, 56, 36, where we have a pattern happening here. We just we just changed it at 44, okay? Anyone else have a guess of how many English vowel phonemes that there are? I see 35, 20. Awesome. So we are definitely going to learn today how many vowel phonemes there are. So that's our first question. The next question, let's go ahead and drop it up. The next question is, what is another word used to describe long vowel sounds? So to describe long vowel sounds, what is another word that we can use? Vowel phonemes, you're not far off there, right? That is, that is a good, that's a good answer, vowel phonemes. There's a more technical term that we'll learn about, but vowel phonemes is a good, good guess. Anyone else know? Go ahead and feel free to drop it in the chat and go. Okay, if you have an answer for that one, go ahead and press go. Nope, uh, y'all said nope, I'm stumped. There you go. Well, so we have some learning to do today, which is exciting. We're glad to be in this space with you. And finally, the, um, the final question is this one. What are vowels? What are vowels? What do you know about vowels? So let's activate our background knowledge. What are vowels? Go ahead and type your answer, don't press go yet. Voice sounds, a speech sound, okay. Sounds found in each word, nice. So far, all of these, Sally, they've got some background knowledge here, so I'm excited about this. Um, a speech sound, awesome. So now that our brains are primed, Sally's gonna go ahead and start giving you some of these answers as we move into um, mm -hmm. deepening our knowledge. Sally, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Absolutely, so the answer to that most recent question that Justin asked is here. A vowel is a speech sound. And several of you actually put this in the chat. Um, when we talk about vowels, um, I don't know about y'all, but in a phonics program I once taught, we taught the vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Those are letters. And we're not talking about those today. We're talking about the sounds today. Um, a vowel, and y'all alluded to almost all the things I'm going to touch on. So that's exciting. Um, a vowel is part of every spoken syllable. Um, all vowels are continuous sounds, which means that you can sing them out. You can say them as long as you can hold your breath. And then we also want to make sure we're also really clear on the fact that vowel sounds can be really tricky for children to distinguish between. Um, those are often some of the sounds that they get tripped up on. And so hopefully today you'll walk away with some ideas on how to help your students with that. All right. We also want to talk about vowels in terms of the manner, voicing, and articulation, or manner, voicing, and place of articulation, MVP. Um, so the manner of our vowel production and of our art articulation is that it's open. Our mouths are open when we say vowel sounds. Somebody said this in terms of the articulation. Our teeth and our lips are not in the way. They're not blocking the flow of air. Um, so we're open. The tongue is involved in articulation, but it can be really hard to feel that. And in terms of voicing, all vowels are voiced sounds. If you put your, your hand on your voice box here, you'll feel it vibrate anytime you make a vowel sound. Um, we talked a little bit about that this in our, our the articulation and the MVP 
P of articulation in our last year long journey. Um, and I think Anisha is going to drop a link in the chat for that. We talked about consonants in that one. And so today we're getting the continuation of that and we're talking about vowels. So before we jump into any more content, um, Justin's going to get us warmed up and pronounce some of our vowel sounds. Awesome. So this next section, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to just warm up your um, your phonological processor by saying some of these sounds. So there's a few symbols we have to be aware of as we move through um, as we move through looking at these sounds. And so on this next slide, what you see is you see these slanted lines that look like slashes. We call those virgules, and virgules just mean that what's inside of those lines represent a sound and not a letter. So we're not just focused on the letter. What we're focused on is we're focused on this sound. And then you see some symbols that you're probably um, used to. And people go back and forth as to how to say these. It's a macron and a breathe, a macron and a breathe. So the macron is the line that goes above that vowel sound. And that makes us know that it's going to be the long vowel sound. And then the breathe looks like a, a U that's kind of been stretched out like a smiley face. And that um, indicates that it's going to make that shorter sound that, we, that we're familiar with. And so we're going to actually learn that those are called tense and lax sounds. So tense and lax sounds instead of long and short. But I want to use some language that you're a little bit familiar with already. So you're going to see a phoneme come up on this screen in just a moment. And when you see it, I'm going to ask you to say it. But remember that sometimes vowel phonemes and really all the phonemes can be pronounced differently based on where we're from. And so we want to be aware of that and just name that out loud because Sally, I'm from Arkansas and sometimes my Arkansas comes right out. Our regional dialects cha change the way that we say um, certain vowels. And I know that's, that happens in different places too. So first, um, everyone come off of mute. You see this, this sound. What sound is this? Say it on the count of three. One, two, three. A. A. Ah. Right, it's A. It's mm -hmm. that, it's that. That vowel sound A. Okay, go ahead and let's look at the next one. We're gonna say them as we see them now. What is this one? E. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Keep going. What is this one? I. I. Awesome. Keep going. What is this one? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. What is this one? This one's a little bit tricky because this one is ooh, ooh. And actually there's kind of two sounds, right? That we, we've been taught that we make for the long vowel sound. It can say you or ooh, you or ooh. Well, that's tricky because that you vowel sound like in cube, that one actually has two phonemes. It's the y and the ooh, the y and the ooh. So that one has two phonemes. So this one is ooh, let's continue. What is this one? This one is ah. Ah. Okay. And the next one. This one is e. e. Awesome. Let's go to the next one. This one is o. o. Okay. And the next one. This one is uh. Uh. Awesome. The next one. What is this one? It was like that one we said earlier. This one is ooh. ooh. Awesome. And now we are going to jump into how do we classify these um, vowel sounds. So how do we group these? And we group them in ways that I kind of gave you a hint of earlier. So we group them by saying they are either tense or lax. And so we're going to look at a word and a picture is going to pop up on the screen on the next slide. And what we ask you to do is repeat the word and then we're going to tap the sounds. So let's go ahead and show that next slide. And so on this slide, now an image is popping up and I want you to look at it. This is a kite. Repeat the word. What's the word? Kite. Let's tap the sounds. K I T. K I T. Kite. Think when you said the I sound, what was your mouth feeling? Was it feeling tense or was it feeling lax? Go ahead and drop that in the chat. Was your mouth feeling tense or lax? K I T. I T. Right? So you should probably feel a little bit of a stretch when you are saying I, I, and that's actually, that's actually tense. So when we make the I sound, everyone say I, I, 
Uh, that should feel a little bit tense. You feel like those muscles moving a little bit um, in your face. Now let's look at the next word. The next word is kit. The word is kit. Say the word. Kit. kit. Let's tap it. 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 You probably now are feeling the difference between that tenseness that was with that I and then that I. And so that feels more lax or relaxed, right? That feels more relaxed. Okay, let's look at the next one. Let me tell you why these are important. So we have one more example. And this example here is a pet. So the first picture is a pet. What's the word? Pet. Let's tap the sounds. Uh, Eh, t. When you say eh, 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 what do you notice? Is it tense or is it lax? Oh, we're catching on. We're catching on. So I see a little bit of a mix between tense and lax. So let's contrast it um, and think about, think about how they might be different. Let's look at this next word. So the next word is tree. Everyone repeat the word tree. Let's tap out the sounds. T E, t, r, e. And so when you say E, is that tense or lax? E, tense. And so I want us to think now say E, 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 and then say E, 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 E. You should feel it like going from um, lax to tense, lax to tense. And why is this important? You may be saying, why are you teaching me this? Well, it's important because we want students to know that when they hear a sound, that when their phonological processor is activated, they have to immediately be begin to connect it back here in their brain to their orthographic processor. And that orthographic processor is the processor in our brain that recognizes letters and combinations of letters that then have to be attached to sounds. So if I'm saying the word tree, tree, and I know that's a tense, that's a tense vowel, then I know that I'm going to find one of the graphemes or the letter combinations that um, are for that are for the um, the tense vowels. And so it, it makes it a little bit easier for us to figure out what spelling we will use based on when we hear the sound. Okay, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. So Sally's going to introduce you to the vowel valley. All right. So on the next slide, you'll see a an image of the vowel valley. And if you're familiar with sound walls, drop in the chat if you've ever seen a sound wall or if you have a sound wall in your classroom. Um, you, if you're not familiar with a sound wall, you may be a little confused about why we have our vowels in this shape. Um, and so what we're going to do is a little activity to explain why. We talked earlier about the manner, voicing, and articulation of our vowels. And sometimes it's child, for children who have a hard time distinguishing between the sounds, it's really helpful to put an emphasis on what their mouth feels like and looks like as we pronounce the sounds. And so in order to do that, you may not have a mirror handy, but I bet you have a phone nearby. So put yourself in selfie mode so that you can look at your, your mouth while we do this next activity. And I want you to put your hand, so one hand you're gonna hold your phone or a mirror, and then on the, in the other hand, you're gonna put flat underneath your chin. And then I want you to just, you don't have to come off me, but just, just repeat after me as we say these sounds. And I want you to pay attention to what your mouth looks like and feels like as we say the sounds. All right, so here we go. E, I, A, E, A, I, A, 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 O, U, U, U. All right. So what did you notice about what was happening with your mouth as we went through the vowel valley? And feel free to type it in the chat. Or come off mute if that is easier. Anybody want to see what they share, what they noticed? When we started out, our mouths with our mouths were in a smile, right? E. 
And then as we worked through the vowel valley, our mouth dropped open a little bit more. Watch my mouth as we do it. Yeah, the mouth, our mouth movement really changed. E, I, A, E, A, I, A. And that A, ah, our mouth is the most open down at the bottom of the vowel valley. Yes, Sue says the chin dropped as we went down the vowel valley. Absolutely. And then it came back up as we went back up. Now, we also have other sounds that are here on the vowel valley. We have um, our R control vowels, er, r, and or. We have diphthongs. These can be kind of tricky for children because our, our mouth is actually in two places. Watch my mouth when I say um, this sound, oi. Ready? Oi. So you'll notice on our sound wall picture here, we have oi. It's both of the, um, the mouth placements. And for ow, it's ow. Diphthongs were especially tricky for my child when he was first learning how to, um, how to read and how all these sounds. Um, and then the schwa, which is actually the most common sound, um, but it's, it can be spelled in a variety of different ways. So when you think about the vowel valley, and you're noticing children who, who may have a hard time distinguishing between the sounds, it may be because these sounds are really close together on the vowel valley and they can't feel, they can't hear the difference, but you might help them by, by putting an emphasis on the way the, that their mouth feels or the way their mouth looks. Um, I did not st start teaching with a mirror at my small group table, but you can get them at the Dollar Tree and they're a really helpful tool um, when it comes to instructing both the consonants and vowels. All right, so in the next activity that we're gonna do, we're not leaving the Vowel Valley just yet, um, we want you to go to the annotate tools. So you're gonna go up to your bar, and you're gonna click on annotate. And if you don't have that capability, we're gonna get it turned on really quickly. And we're gonna have you click on the stamp. Now that is going to allow you to mark on our Zoom call. And so we're gonna do a little activity here in just a few seconds. If you can, get, if you have access to the annotate tool, go ahead and make a stamp on the, on the screen so we can know it's working. Oh, Mandy's there. Awesome. Yay. OK, great. It doesn't matter which stamp you choose as long as you can kind of indicate. All right. So let's give everybody just another second or two to kind of get those on. I see about six or seven people who have figured out that annotate. And if you don't have access to this, if you're joining from your phone, feel free to type the answers in the chat as well. All right. So let's go to the next slide. All right, now I'm going to say some words and I want you to put, all right, can we clear those annotations? Um, I'm gonna say some sounds and we're gonna put the um, stamps on the vowel card for the sound that we're saying. So the first one is blue. So go ahead and put a stamp on the sound for blue. You can look at my mouth as I say the word blue. All right, blue sounds a lot like tuna. It's that long U sound. Anita Archer calls it, that's the letter name, not the, not the long sound, but it's the name. All right, let's clear those and do another one. Sally, I think that's that may be a, a moment right here because I think a lot of people put that O-O. Oh, oh right? yeah, because and, that's and how it that sounds. And that sound is tricky Yeah. because O-O oh, oh, we know uh. said ooh, but this one right here is that O uh, sound, that mm -hmm. O uh, sound. And so yeah, that's, and like, you, and that's like in the word bush, bush, right? So that's that O uh, sound. Mm -hmm. And so it, may be sure hard, that. it may be hard to see on the screen too. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do another one. Let's do the word heart. What sound do you hear? What vowel sound do you hear in heart? That one's a little easier. Yeah. Absolutely. That's down in our R controlled vowels. All right, let's do another one. Let's do bird. Bird. Great. All right. 
let's do, all right, this one might be a little bit tricky, but I think we can handle it. All right, let's think about what Justin just said and do the sound um, wood, the vowel sound in wood. Yeah, it's that uh, like in bush. And this really does vary by dialect. Um, I typed it in the chat earlier. We have a participant from Northern Ireland here, and my guess is that she probably says these sounds a whole lot differently than I do in my South Georgia accent. Um, all right, let's do bald. Bald. similar to saw, or you may pronounce it and it sounds like the ah and octopus. I mean, those. this is why vowels are tricky. It really does depend on your dialect. All right, let's do one more. Let's do voice. Voice. Yes, it's that diphthong, the O-I sound. All right, so now that you have looked at our vowel valley, one of our questions in our waterfall chat was how many vowel phonemes are there? So we have 15 plus our R controlled and the schwa. So lots and lots of vowel sounds in English. Let's look at the next slide. Because my guess is that some of you, and let us know in the chat, are going to have some children who speak Spanish as their first language in your classroom. Does anybody have any Spanish speakers? Oh, somebody's asking about the Vowel Valley. It is going to be on Cox campus very, very soon, um, by the first of the year, um, for sure. So keep uh, stay tuned on that. We'll post it on social media when it's available. All right, so we have some children who speak um, Spanish. We have some Spanish speakers and we have someone who speaks Portuguese. Okay, so this is the Spanish vowel valley. So you'll remember we have all those vowel sounds in English, but in Spanish, there are only five. So there are whole sounds, vowel sounds in Spanish or in English that do not exist in Spanish. And so children who speak Spanish or Portuguese, because I'm sure there are differences there. I don't know that one off the top of my head. Um, it is, I think it's mylanguages.org can give you a lot of information about the languages that you, uh, for the children speaking in your classroom. But it's really important for us as teachers to get to know the languages and the dialects that are spoken in our classrooms because children may, sh may have a hard time, not because they can't hear the sounds because they, they're just, or they haven't been taught. They literally do not have these sounds in their spoken language. And so we have to teach it. We have to teach the sound in our spoken language first, and then we can attach a letter to it. Um, and so for the vowel sounds, they are um, E represented by the I, A like in the word trace, A like masa, O as in ocho, and U as in Uno. Um, and so it's just important to note, and it's kind of interesting. I wish when I had taught 30% uh, of my kids spoke Spanish as their first language, I wish I'd known this information when I was in that classroom, um, but I didn't. So now y'all do, and this will also be on Cox campus. Um, it'll be released when we release the oral language course um, in the beginning of the year, if not before. So. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. We're going to talk about um, our instruction, the vowel classification and articulation instruction. All right, so on the next slide, we have a continuum. Um, uh, or This is not a continuum. It looks like a continuum. And I was taught with phonemic awareness that it was a continuum the when I was first taught, introduced to phonemic awareness instruction. But it's not. You don't have to wait for children to um, learn word awareness, syllable awareness, then onset rhyme before you get to the end goal of phonemic awareness. And we have highlighted a few really key elements of phonological awareness instruction that are critical for children who are learning to read. These are the most critical components and we can jump right into these even with kindergartners or pre-K students. So phoneme isolation, identification, 
blending and segmenting. These are the part, these are the, the key elements that are the most important. They don't have to write master rhyming. They don't have to master syllables before we get to the phoneme level. So right. I'm glad you cleared yeah, that go up. Ahead. Mm -hmm. no, no, I'm glad you cleared that up because I think a lot of people have heard, and I heard this when I was going through my pre-service education, mm -hmm. is that if students can't rhyme, they can't read, right? And so I think teachers sometimes think like they have to go through that continuum like it is a um mm -hmm. like a scope and sequence of skills. And this is not a scope and sequence of skills. Yeah. This is really just showing which skills are less complex and which skills are mm -hmm. more complex. And so it's important to important to know that. There is in the chat. A question from Mandy about guidance with um, the r sound and the mm. r sound. And Mandy, we see that all the time, right? That for the r sound, students say er. Mm. I think one thing that's going to be really helpful, and I'm actually going to go to the next slide now, <clears throat> is using a letter keyword sound. Oh, actually, that's mm -hmm. not yet, but <laughs> it's coming up soon, um, letter keyword sound. And so mm -hmm. hang tight. And when we get there, I just want her to know that we're going to answer that question. Absolutely. I'm looking at the chat now. Um, and there's another comment in here about Spanish being a clear language or a more, has a more shallow orthography, whereas English is more opaque. It is a deeper orthography. There's less of a regular connection between the sounds in spoken language and the way they're represented in print. Um, so those are all really good things to know. All right, now let's go on to the next slide. And on this one, we're going to talk about um, the keywords that we chose for that vowel valley and for an, um, a resource that Justin's going to share with you in just a minute. Um, for the short A sound, we chose apple, which is pretty typical, right? In a lot of our, um, our, our phonics programs and in phonological awareness instruction before um, that we've seen in the past. For E, the short E sound, we have echo. For the short I sound, we have itch. For short O, we chose octopus. And for short U, we chose up. Now, when I was in the classroom and teaching a phonics program, my short E keyword was egg. My short I keyword was igloo and my short U keyword was umbrella. And so we were really intentional about not choosing those for a specific reason. When we pronounce these sounds in isolation, they're, they're easier to hear than when we're saying them in a stream of speech. So when we're saying them all together and that's because our the letters that surround the vowel sounds influence the way that they are pronounced. And we call that co-articulation. Um, so if you put, if you take the word, um, let's do umbrella, which was the one that was at the U sound, the, for the short U sound. Umbrella has a M mm right behind the U. It's a nasal and it impacts the way that we pronounce the short U. So we want to try to pick key words where it's really clear what the sound is. Now, igloo is a little bit prog problematic because in certain dialects, it's not a short I, it's, an, it's more like a long E, igloo. Same for egg. I pronounce egg with a short E sound, but my grandmother pronounces it egg. She's from South Dakota. So we tried to choose um, keywords. And when you're doing instruction, choose keywords. Think about the kids in your class. Think about the languages and the dialects that they speak and choose keywords that are going to have a really, really clear um, sound associated with them. Now, and so pretty much avoiding nasals like the mm, mm, and mm, and then liquids, l and r, those really impact the pronunciation of the vowel sound. Um, so while we're on this slide, I want us to talk about gestures just a little bit. Now, the, the articulatory gestures that we really want to emphasize is really the way the mouth feels. So for apple, for, for the short A sound, it's a. Ah. Ah, our mouth is really open. We kind of have a smile on our face. Ah, ah. We want to really emphasize our mouth when we're teaching our children. And that's why we need the mirrors. OK, but you can use some hand gestures as well and use these as a scaffold. So for ah, you might use like you're biting an apple. Ah, and you're making kind of the same sound for for the short E sound. It would be eh, echo like you're kind of you're almost like 
emphasizing your mouth there. For the short I sound, it could be itch, like you're scrunching up your nose, itch. For octopus, ah. And for the short U sound, uh, uh. You could use your thumb and do the uh. When I was teaching, it was uh, like you're poking into your belly. <laughs> you could do that too. Um, and in the chat, there is a link to one of our um, subject matter experts who helps consult with our course, at, course development process, Margie Gillis from Literacy How. She also has some articulatory gestures that you can use as scaffolds with your children. Um, now, remember, the gesture we really want to emphasize is the way the mouth feels. But these these little like the ah and the eh, these are things we can use to kind of cue the kids as they're reading to help remember them. All right. And the next slide that we have, I think Justin is going to talk about this is what you were talking about with your keywords. Right. And um, so helping kids mm -hmm. understand the difference between that er and that r sound this can help. So using keyword cards can be really useful to students. And this is useful because it gives them the scaffold and it helps build their muscle memory so that they're retrieving the um, both the sound and the spelling at the same time. And so this ventures a little bit into phonics land and it, we're gonna say it ventures into phonics because we're, you see, you may see some print with these cards, right? You may see the letters that attach to the sound. However, um, let's, let's think about er and r those two sounds, right? And sometimes it's just that we haven't taught students that phoneme correctly. That in, in many classrooms we hear that that R sound, we say, we hold up the letter R and students say er, where we really need to correct them and say, no, it's r, r. And we can help them by doing this. We can give them the spelling. We can say R, r robot, R, r, robot, right? And so you see on the screen, you're saying the spelling, the letter R, the sound, and then the keyword, which would be robot. I like to tell people all the time because this gets confused. We never say come set on the er rug, do we in our classrooms? We don't, right? Because that's not how we say that r sound, that r sound. And so that's tricky. I think also, Sally, like you were saying earlier, getting out that mirror and helping them see the difference. Like when I say er, er, and r, that looks a lot alike. And so that can be tricky. And so we have to really help them see the difference there. And so this is a this is a tool that can help them. So using keywords can be helpful. We do this by saying the spelling, the sound, and then the keyword. You may have seen this where instead we do the spelling key, keyword, then the sound. That's been a common practice in phonics for programs. Actually, they've learned that by putting the keyword at the end, that's an easier scaffold to remove, right? It's easier if they have the spelling and the sound and they capture that then they can remove the scaffold if they don't need it. And so let's practice what it would look like with the one on the screen here. So what I would do is I would say A-Y, A, play. Say it with me, A-Y, play. I'm sorry, oh, that's my old school coming in. A-Y, A, play, right? Like I'm having to restructure myself because that's how I was taught as well. Um, and so we put that scaffolding word at the end so they have a cue to help them remember what sound those led that spelling pattern is making. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next one. So the next one, this is for um, one of those diphthongs, oi, oi. So we would say oi, oi, coin. Say it with me. Oi, oi, coin. And so when you do this over and over with students, it helps them build that muscle memory and be able to retrieve both the spelling and the sound together. It's also strengthening that connection between the phonological processor that's up here and that orthographic processor back here so that it can work within milliseconds to retrieve that both when reading and writing. Okay, let's look at our final one. We have one more. And it's this one. It's ooh. And so we would say oh, oh, ooh moon. Oh, oh, ooh, moon. And so I want to show you, and I'm going to actually turn my background off so you can see this on my, um, on my screen. Um, this is a sound card from a different program. And so you probably noticed that there are several spellings underneath. And that's okay, because really what we're trying to do is we're trying to take students from the sound to the spelling. 
And so we want them to hear ooh and then think which spelling pattern works for that ooh sound. And so we're gonna talk about sound walls versus word walls here in just a moment. And this will make a little bit of a connection there. Okay, doke. Let's go ahead and talk about a few other instructional materials that we have. We've actually created some materials for you today to, um, to use as you're teaching um, these vowel sounds, especially these short vowel sounds. And I'm gonna pose a question in the chat. Why do you think it is so important that students master short vowel sounds and the letters that are connected to them? Why do you think that it is so important for students to master short vowel sounds and the letters that are connected to them. Go ahead and drop your answer in the chat. Bingo, right? Every word has to have at least a vowel. And actually in our English language, I think it's right at or a little bit over maybe 50%, 50% of what we read are closed syllables. 50% of what we read are closed syllables, which are those CVCs or that vowel consonant, which is a short vowel sound. And so it's, yes, the majority of common words incorporate this. So it's critical that students have this mastered and that they really master it early on in what, what I call their reading career, right? Early on as they're learning to read. And so what you what we are what we're giving you today, and we're gonna drop this um a link to this product, which there's the the vowel sticks and the tent cards that are in this PDF that will be dropped in the chat. You can go to that Google Drive there and access it. What I've done is I've I'm gonna show you what the routine looks like for this. And so when you have these cards in your classroom or these sticks, these are the popsicle sticks, here's what it would look like. On one side, there is the apple, and that's, that's just a cue or a scaffold. On the other side, it's the letter that makes that sound. And so here's what I would do. I would say the sound is a, ah. repeat, a. Ah. Show me the letter that represents a. Ah. And so your students would have a set of sticks that look like this. So they would have a set of sticks that look like this. And they would choose it and they would show you. They would say, and they would say this. They would show this, and then you would confirm and say, that's right. A represents a. You're probably noticing that I'm not saying A says a, because guess what? Letters don't say anything. They represent sounds, right? Letters don't say anything, they represent sounds. And so we want to change our language to help students understand that. Let's do another one. So that the, it would look like this. The sound is a. Uh. Repeat, uh, show me the letter. Okay, and then they would show you the letter and you'd say, that's right, you represents a. Uh. Okay, and so that's one way to do this. Another way that you can use these, um, there's these little table tent cards that look like this. And so they have the letter on one side, the picture on the other. They look just like, they look just like those tents, um, the picture and the letter. And so you could use those if you choose not to use the popsicle sticks, but we can also do this with words so that students start identifying those vowel sounds in words. And so I'm gonna give one example and it's gonna look like this. The word is mop, repeat, mop. Let's tap out the sounds, m, mm, ah. Uh. What's the word? Mop. Now what I want you to do is as you tap out the sounds, I want you to show me the vowel that represents the vowel sound in that word. And so they would say, m, mm, Ah, uh, mm, ah, uh, what's the word? Ma, that's right. O represents ah uh in ma. And so that's how that routine works. Pretty, pretty easy. The last thing is something that you may already do, but that is really, really um, important for students as we're building phonemic awareness is to use Alconan boxes to represent sounds. And so Sally is going to help demonstrate. She's going to play student for just a second. Um, so like, can you turn off your background? And so I'm gonna give her a word and then we're gonna show you how through the use of using probing questions, she can help identify what the vowel sounds are, okay? And so the first word that I'm going to give Sally is the word pet. So Sally, what's the word? Pet. Okay, go ahead and move your um, counters. All right. Oh, backwards, sorry. Eh. Okay, so it would be et, right? And so now what I would ask her is I would use a probing question. I would say, where do you hear the S sound in the word pet? And she could point to it, right? Right there in the middle. 
Okay, go ahead and clear the counters. Let's do another one. Mm -hmm. Let's use this. So thinking about our soundboard um, or the, the, the vowel valley, um, this one would come up and it's more than just a short vowel sound. It's one of our other sounds. The word is bow. What's the word, mm -hmm. Sally? Bow. Okay, you want to show me? All right. B. B. O. Awesome. And what is our word? Our word is bow. bow. Where do you hear that O sound in bow? <laughs> I can't see what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yep, you're right. Okay, awesome. And then finally, mm -hmm. she's going to clear her board. And the last word is mm -hmm. eat. Eat. All right. What's e the word? Yeah. Eat. Sorry. There you go. You want to move them? Eat. Awesome. Where in the word eat do you hear the E sound? And so just by using probing questions, we can help students identify those vowel sounds in words. Um, and so those are just a few activities that you can use as you are building. Um, so, yep, Sally was showing in her camera view, Mandy. Um, I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. and so these are just a few activities that you can use to help students really master those vowel phonemes. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take just a second to ask a question. And we're going to move into looking at um, a speech to print mindset shift. In the chat, you're going to see a link to the document that's over here. It's rather wordy, so we're not going to actually go through it right now. But it really outlines the difference between a speech to print approach and a print to speech approach. So Sally, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it from here. All right, so you'll notice on the screen, and we're going to talk a little bit about sound walls um, here. You'll notice that we have a traditional word wall on the screen. And I'm curious to know, this is print to speech approach, right? Okay, so look at looking at this, do you see any problems that we may encounter by thinking about the spellings and organizing things by spellings on a word wall. Do you see any problems? If the purpose is to help children learn how to spell the words. Pull up my chat. Okay, Mandy is seeing the K-N and we know that that is pronounced N. So if a child knows that the N makes the N sound. Where are they going to look for the word? No, they're going to look for it under the N, right? They're not going to look for it over here under the K. What other problems do you see? Yeah, one letter has different sounds and sound walls are more helpful. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, and let's go one more. You'll see an example. That's a vowel valley that we have for you. All right, and our Vowel Valley, again, it will be coming out soon. The ones that the one that is in this um, presentation is from um, Tools for Reading. Um, all right, so look at these letters. Let's look at the letter C. This is a traditional word wall. Everybody type it in the chat. What problems do you see? What words might they have a hard time with? Soft C versus hard C, right? All right, so um, and if we click in, we will notice that we have a difference in... I don't know if it's maybe our, our animation is not working, but yeah, the city is going to be a problem and scent is going to be a problem because where are those children going to look for that, those sounds under the letter S? We already talked about no. And then, oh my gracious, how many different sounds do we have represented <laughs> by the letter O? We have ow, the diphthong, oi, another diphthong, off, and open. We have four different sounds, all for letter O. So the word walls that I don't know about y'all, I was taught word walls um, as a college student. There are the animations taking a minute. Um, I was taught these as a college student back in the 90s, and mine even had the little um, shapes around them to show which ones went high and which ones went low. Um, so that was what I, mean, I was literally taught that in school. And we now know that there that that can be a little bit problematic. And so sound walls are a great alternative and still help children do what the word wall was supposed to do, which is teach children how to spell these words that they may not know and what letters represent what sounds. All right. So in the next slide. We want to hit our um, session goals again. We have discussed the manner, voicing, articulation, and classification of vowel phonemes. 
We explored um, some instructional strategies for explicitly teaching our vowel phonemes. And we talked about the difference between sound walls and word walls. So on the next slide, we're gonna give you an opportunity to reflect. We want you to think about three things you've taken away from today. You can do this privately by yourself or we'd love to see what you've taken away in the chat. Um, if you have any questions that are, st are still circling for you. Um, and then what is something that you learned that squares with your thinking or your beliefs? So take a moment to reflect. We would love to hear from you in the chat. I love that Christina is going to use mirrors. I, so really I, want, to add, I want to add to that because Christina using <laughs> that, that is so important because when our brain mm. is mapping those sounds, Linnea area and the studies that she's done, what they've realized is that when the brain maps sounds, it doesn't just map the auditory sound. It mm -hmm. also maps those articulatory gestures that we've been working on. So what is happening and what does the mouth look like and feel like is very mm -hmm. important to the brain recognizing and using those sounds. Awesome. It really does help it stick. There are multiple um, programs out there that, that kind of teach that. Lips is from Linda Moon Bell is one that really puts a good emphasis on the articulatory features um, that you don't necessarily have to be lips trained to be able to use that same technique. Um, we get sound walls, use of mirrors and saying letters represent not making sound. I love that shift. It's minor. It seems minor, but it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, and y'all mirrors at the Dollar Tree. I bought some the other day. So it's a great source for that. Anybody else want to share? Keep sharing. Oh, lip mirrors. His children watch watch their eyes too much and smile at themselves. Yeah. You, um, when I taught kindergarten, you would, anytime you introduced a new material, you would always give them a few minutes just to kind of play with it and explore. But once they get into the routine, you know, okay, everybody hold it up. All right. Let's go. We're going to make this sound. Let's make that ah sound. Ah. All right. Let's put your mirror down and then move on. All right. We have another private message saying shifting from letters, make sounds to shift, shift letters represent. That's awesome. All right. Oh, good. Somebody wants to know about the recording. Um, and actually, we're going to let's move on to the next slide um, and close out our session here today. We're going to launch a poll. We're going to um, let you know, let us know how we did. And we're going to give you a heads up about our next session, which is January 26th. We'll be talking, doing phonemic awareness again. We'll talk about the levels and instruction. And so for the person, whoever it was who said about the recording, um, Anisha is going to drop a link to where we keep the recordings of all of our year long journey sessions on our YouTube channel. Um, so you're going to be able to access those anytime and you can go back and watch the one on consonants that we did last month i was the moderator for that one and they did a great job and sam says they're all posted within 24 hours all right and you can also always connect with us on social media on the next slide we have all the ways to um to contact us we are at cox campus please let us know how we did in the poll Thank you guys for your thoughtful feedback. This is amazing. I love to hear what all you're going to do and change and what you're thinking about and what you've learned. We really appreciate. Oh, no, Unique was not able to hear this session today. Um, Unique, this will be up within 24 hours on our YouTube session or, or on our YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us and for taking time out of a long day right before holiday. <laughs> um, those of you who are in the U.S., thanks so much.